Welcome to our Your Stock Comment Writing Workshop. My name is Hannah Moreno. I'm a Amamutsun Tribal member, and I'll be your host this evening. We are very pleased to be able to host this event tonight um, and to invite you all to stand with us in the protection of your stock uh, during this crucial moment. The response from all of you to our invitation to attend this uh, workshop has already been very inspiring. Over 300 uh, people have registered to attend, which is awesome. Um, before we get started, we would love to hear from all of you. Um, if you would like to share in the chat uh, where you are joining us from um, this evening or what brings you here tonight. During this event, uh, we will hear from several different speakers. Um, those, uh, those speakers are going to share with you about our sacred site, your stock, uh, the approval process for the proposed mining project that threatens it, and how you can write an impactful EIR comment letter to challenge the project in different ways. So as the screen, you can see um, just kind of our schedule for this evening. Um, we have some knowledgeable speakers this evening. Um, we're going to start off with Alexi Sagona. He's a representative from our Amamutsun tribal, or tribal Youth Group. Uh, Valentin Lopez, our tribal chairman. Uh, Sarah Clark will go after a partner and attorney at an esteemed environmental law firm, Shoots Moholy and Weinberger. And we'll end the evening um, with our presentations with Tiffany Yap, a conservation biologist at the Center of Biological Diversity. Oh, awesome. I see all of you in the chat now. The chat is going wild. I love it. Um, it looks like some people from San Jose. I see Redwood City, Aptos, San Francisco. Oh, awesome. I see Colleen um, put out uh, Mawekma territory. Awesome. I love to see that as well, um, saying where you're from. Uh, with our native lands. Awesome. I see a lot of people, San Jose and some other uh, people putting in where they are from with tribal affiliation. I love it. Awesome. Keep it coming. I see a lot of you in there chatting away, saying where you're from. Awesome. Welcome. And thank you so much for coming. Um, at the end of the evening, um, after our presentations, we are going to do a QA and a um, that will invite you all to join our optional workshopping time um, after the Q&A, where there will be breakout rooms and more time for you to discuss maybe what you would like to um, put into your letter um, and any other questions that you have. Um, if you have any questions during the presentations, we ask you to use the Zoom um, Q&A function at the bottom of your screen in the menu. Um, if you don't see it, it might be in the three dots for the more. Um, if you can put your questions in there and they'll be answered at the end during the Q&A section. Also, if you are not able to do that, you can always put it into the chat as well. Oh, awesome. I see so many other people up there putting in where they're from as well. Awesome. Thank you. So we would like to encourage everyone to engage with each other tonight in a careful and respectful manner. Um, we come to this work of protecting Neurostock um, from a desire to join forces for our healing and yours in the land. And um, we hope we can conduct ourselves in this workshop and can be part of that healing. I'm gonna go ahead, we're going to open up um, this evening with a prayer. Um, we, our honored elder and tribal council member, Eleanor Castro, um, will be opening this evening's event with a prayer. So I'll go ahead and hand it over to her. I'm going to stand. I will usually stand for our prayer, so I'm going to stand. You can too, if you can. Creator, thank you for this day. We thank you for our lives. Creator, we just want to thank you for bringing all the people that are here today and maybe more who are coming. I want to bless them. I want you to bless them for they have come here to help us to fight to protect your stock. Creator, we just love you and we want to do your, 
your bidding to us, your, your gift to us is to protect the lands. And, and these lands are, are very uh, sacred to our tribe, sacred to the people. Not only the land, but the, the, the animals and the um, plants that are, are um, sacred to us that we use for, um, for all kinds of things, medicine, basketry. Creator, we wanna protect these things. Please be with us to, to fight this battle and continue on. Creator, we ask you to be with us and, and, and just get all the knowledge and the people uh, that can help us fight it. Creator, bless all that are on, on this Zoom Bless all of our relatives. Bless the whole world. Aho. Thank you, Eleanor, for grounding us in this really important, um, as we go into our work, that's extremely important. Thank you so much. I'm gonna go ahead and go into our first speaker. Um, our first speaker is Alexi Sagona. Uh, he is a PhD student at UC Berkeley and a representative of our Amamutsun Tribal Youth um, Organized Committee. Uh, welcome, Alexi. Thank you so much, Hannah, for, for that introduction. And Hannah is also a, a leader in our youth group. So, um, and shout out to all the, the tribal members here joining on this call. I see a lot of folks here and a lot of friends and, you know, other folks here joining us, good allies. So really thank you for coming in a good way. Uh, my task tonight is just to share a little bit about what is your stock and kind of give some context. For some of you, it's gonna be a refresher and for some other folks, it's gonna hopefully give a little bit more information about what your stock is, its importance to the community and things like that. So I hope you can see my screen here. Um, this is a photo of the Amamutsu youth group doing uh, our 2020 walk for Eurostock. Uh, during the pandemic, we couldn't have a big walk, but uh, many of our youth came out and we walked five miles to the foothills of Eurostock to, to honor our ancestors. Um, Hannah is actually all the way on the right right there. Thank you so much. So, you know, Eurostock is a, is a place of power for Amamutsu people. Um, some liken it to a, a church or, you know, a religious site. Uh, but for many indigenous peoples, you can't really build a sacred place um, out of a, a structure. Instead, it's a, it's a place that's intertwined with the landscape. Um, it holds power in and of itself. Uh, and so in that sense, it can't be moved somewhere else. Um, and, you know, it is an intact cultural landscape. So today, there's still those rolling grasslands and oak woodlands um, dotting the landscape. And there's not a lot of development there because it's at the very southern end of San Mateo County. Uh, and we hope to bring ceremony back to Eurostock because this was the place where our big head dances were held for many, many generations. Um, right now, as a, as a non federally recognized tribe without any land of our own, we don't have access to Eurostock and we're unable to, to bring back ceremony at this time. And here's a, a map to help us get situated. So at the bottom left, you may be able to see uh, Highway 101, kind of going through Morgan Hill and then Gilroy, and then just above San Juan Batista, that is where uh, Sergeant Ranch is. So it's at the very tip of, um, of Santa Clara County when you're driving on 101 and you can see the rolling grasslands. And so that is the heart of Mutsun territory. It is our most uh, sacred place. And so here on the, the bigger map, more to the right, you can see that they're gonna have you know, very large processing plants uh, and pits, uh, these open pits that are so destructive to our landscape, uh, so impactful for us to be able to have, you know, ceremony when thinking about the noise, when thinking about the lights and the, all the other machinery going on there. It's it's a very uh, impactful uh, application that they're they're trying to do there. And you know what's at stake is uh, we can't relocate, you know, place of the big head. That place is a, is a place of power for us, but that can't just simply be relocated somewhere else as any form of mitigation. 
And, you know, I've talked with many other youth members of the Amamutsun, and they see their, their children and their grandchildren holding ceremony at Yurithok one day. There's that really beautiful vision for the future that our tribe has to heal from colonialism and return to our ancestral places. And, you know, the Amamutsun, we're still actively doing gatherings and cultural events, activities, and going on to different culturally significant lands. And it has provided healing for many of our members many members actually here attending as well. And so this would just be another example of, of providing those you know, healing effects. Uh, on, the, on the flip side, you know, this damage and destruction from colonialism that really ripped apart our people, our culture, and thought to erase us can just continue. And it can look like this, where our most sacred site, our, our church, if you will, uh, turns into a, a quarry. Uh, here is a nearby quarry, um, the granite rock quarry. Uh, just for a reference. And here is also what a processing plant looks like too. So it's not just a quarry, it's the associated machinery that comes out there that makes all this noise that affects the wildlife, the, the sanctity of the place, and really just desecrates it. And so it's just so important that y'all are here today. You know, 202 participants, that is just amazing. Because right now is the time uh, to help and get involved and write these letters, it means so much for us, for our community, uh, just standing up for human rights, the rights of nature, Mother Earth. Really, it's just so important right now. And this is the way that your voice can be hold, heard. And additionally, you know, on September 10th, we're gonna be holding a really important rally in San Jose. And I hope everyone will be able to come. And uh, We're gonna bring more details about that soon. So I'll stop there. Thanks so much for listening. All right, thank you, Alexi, so much. Um, we're going to go ahead and go to our second speaker. Um, our second speaker will be our respected Omomutsin Tribal Chairman, Valentin Lopez. All right, go ahead, Chairman. Yes, thank you very much, Hannah. Um, and thank you for those who are here tonight. This is incredible. You know, this this continues to amaze me every time because we held people together. You know, that EIR, that draft EIR, we kept saying for over three years, it'll be out next week. <laughs> and we just kept waiting and waiting. And I was really worried that we were gonna lose the, that we were gonna lose, you know, interest from the people, but it didn't wane. It just, it just continued and it got stronger and stronger. So that, you know, that is, so um, so wonderful for our tribe to see and experience. A big part of our tribe and our history was, was, was just trust, trusting the outside world. And, uh, and that is really difficult, but the, the support that we received on Eurostock is something that we could have never imagined, never imagined. And so we thank you all for, for, for being here this evening. And... Um, We'll work together. We have a great team here at Eurus, you know, on the Protect Your Stock effort. We really do have a great team. And um, and they're a lot smarter than I am, but we'll we'll keep it going. You know, they wanted me to talk about comments related to cultural resources. And um, and the harm that's going to be done by the mining permit, it's just gonna be tremendous. Just tremendous. Um, first of all, you know, we say it's a sacred site, but when you look at the history of Native American spirituality, all those anthropologists, all the way through the 1990s and into, you know, in, in, in the 1900s, all the way through the 2000s, they never wrote about Native American spirituality, where those locations were where their practices were, why it's important. And they, there was no value to Native American spirituality. They thought that we were just heathens and devil worshipers. That's where the Diablo rains got their mountains from. They, we, we prayed to the mountains, for the mountains. We prayed to, um, to the, the, you know, the, uh, Mount Diablo. That was, a, that was an absolute sacred site. And they called it the, you know, Mount Diablo. So whenever we would pray to our mountains, we were worshiping the devil. That's how those sites got their names. And now they, and now on this, 
draft the IR, they're still ignoring our spirituality. Why aren't they talking about that? Why is that, you know, not, not important? You don't see them saying, well, let's just tear off 20%, 10% or 20% of the Vatican and everything will be fine. That, that, that would never happen because this is Native American and because we're a federally unrecognized tribe. It doesn't matter. The law, the regulations that are there now allow it to happen. We're not, you know, we're fighting for that. The um, Eurostock has been recognized as a human rights issue. And it's been recognized as a human rights issue by the Santa Clara County Human Rights Commission. And that truly, truly means something. That means that they, if they intentionally destroy and well, approve the mine and destroy our most sacred site, they will knowingly and intentionally be destroying um, our, our, our human rights. And it goes beyond that. The United, De United Nations definition of genocide includes you know, the destruction and domination of people's spirituality and culture. What's going to happen here? If Eurostock is approved, it truly will be destroying Mutsin culture and it will be destroying Mutsin spirituality. And there again, if it's approved, the county board of supervisors and the county planners will knowingly and intentionally be committing genocide against the Amamutsin tribe and against indigenous people. That is not in the report anywhere. That is not in the report anywhere. They try, my, my, um, my brother used to have a saying, and if any of you ever knew my brother, he's kind of a little crazy, but he used to always say, you know, well, let's just keep it fluffy. I mean, he'd say that sarcastically, let's just keep it fluffy. Well, that's what the county and that's what the developer want to do here. They want to just keep it fluffy. And, and, and ignore the, the human rights element, ignore the spirituality of it, ignore the history of the indigenous people of this area. The, the, the greater Santa um, uh, Monterey Bay area was the most populated area north of Mexico City. I don't know how many people realize that or know that. It is the most populated area north of uh, uh, North of Mexico City. And yet we were wiped out. I mean, our tribe population reduced by well over 98%. Why doesn't the draft EIR talk about the impact of that history on the Amamutsin tribe? That history isn't important. Let's keep it light and fluffy. At Eurostock, now, Eurostock was the home of our spiritual leader, Kuksui. Kuksui was the one that held our ceremonies there for the big head dances. We held a lot of other ceremony there, and other spiritual leaders would come in for those other um, ceremonies. And Kuksui would just do the ceremonies, the, 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 the big head and other ceremonies that were in, especially important to, you know, to our people. For our ceremonies, people would come from the from the Yosemite area. They would come, you know, the Shumash would come up from down south. The Pomo would travel down to our territory for the for the big head dances. I want to thank you and, and I want to talk about how important it is to write comments. Whenever we started opposing, you know, whenever we spoke out in opposition to the mining permit. We were told that the only thing that would stop it was overwhelming public support. The, the regulations, the county regulations and the general plan allow this mining permit to be approved. There's nothing to stop it. And the developers know it. The developers know it. And so, you know, as I said, the only thing that will stop it is overwhelming public support. And that puts a real high bar for us especially a tribe that you know, did not have a lot of trust with the outside world and dealing with others. That we brought an, an, um, a Protect Eurostock um, organization together and we love them and we're so thankful for that. It's just amazing. 
But our work is certainly cut out for it, for us. And that's why we're here tonight. So those on this call, please recognize the importance of these comments. And you can, well, they'll talk about this more, but you can submit multiple comments, but please have, you know, have your, you know, have your, um, your, your, your family, have the um, others in, the, in your social circle, have your, you know, people you work with and people you go to school with, get on them and tell them to, you know, write these comments and tell them to tell their people, their circles to please do the same. We need that overwhelming public support. We need to rec we need the county to recognize the sacred site. We need to recognize it as a sacred site. Impact to the tribe if <clears throat> the impact to the tribe if this is approved, it will once again show that that period of destruct pure destruction and domination and genocide of indigenous people that period never ended. It just evolved. And it evolved to the actions that we're seeing now with the county, How, you know, where they would even consider destroying the most sacred site of an indigenous tribe. Can you imagine them destroying a sacred site? Uh, destroying a sacred site where it was another faith, if it was if it, if it was Baptist or Jew uh, or Jewish or Buddhist or Catholic or or Mormon, anything like that. Could you imagine them doing that? No, it would never happen. It only can happen to a Native American tribe that is federally unrecognized. We must stop that. If we are successful in stopping the mines, the mining permit from being approved, you know, you know, we 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 want to be able to find we want to be able to find a way to have Eurostock brought into the you know uh, protected as conservation lands. And we would like our tribe to be part of that conservation effort and, and, and plans. So what we want to happen at Eurostock is we first want to restore sacredness. We used to have four tribal villages right there at Eurostock or right very close, very close proximity to Eurostock. And their obligation was to keep those lands sacred and ready for ceremony at all times. Those lands must be sacred. That sacredness has been destroyed. But it is the Amamutsu's responsibility to restore that sacredness. And that's what that's the first that, that's what our tribe must do. We must also, well, well the other vision we have is restoring um Eurostock as a tribal park and have it be a place for uh you know for conservation, for research research of our history, the true history of our tribe, and the true history of the way our people took care of the plants and the wildlife and the waters, and the way our ceremonies were a big, were very much a part of that effort. We want the tribal park to provide for education, education for our tribal members, but also education for the public so that we can tell the truth about that history and that we can tell the truth about how to take care of Mother Earth. You know, now, you know, a perfect example is fire. You know, our people would use controlled burns under very frequent, you know, every seven, eight, 10 year period of time, they would burn. And you've avoided those catastrophic buildup. But whenever the Spanish came, they stopped indigenous burning during the Mexican period. They stopped indigenous burning during the American period. They stopped indigenous burning. And now look at that, the whole state's on fire. And, um, and such, and, and, and you know, and they believe that their knowledge is superior. They totally ignore indigenous science, indigenous traditional science. That is completely ignored. We must bring that back, and that's why that education component is so important. We want to bring back biodiversity. Here's another thing: that Greater Monterey Bay was one of the most bi biodiverse landscapes in North America. What happened to that biodiversity? What happened? They stopped burning. And that coastal prairie was immediately overcome with shrubs and then trees. And that coastal prairie is gone. And it was that coastal prairie where that biodiversity existed. A large, a, 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 an important goal of our tribe is to restore that biodiversity at 
the coastal prairie, but at, throughout our, 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 throughout our traditional lands. And finally, that tribal park would provide food, medicine, materials for women's care, materials for baby's care, for our house, housing, for our clothing, and on and on. It's so important that we come back, that our culture come back and not be lost. That's what we're fighting for here. We're fighting to not become extinct. I'm gonna stop there. I think I got through the, the points that I wanted to cover and you'll have an opportunity for questions later. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chairman. I know you're always working very tirelessly on behalf of all of us and our people. So appreciate that. Thank you so much. Uh, we're gonna go into our third speaker, um, will be Sarah Clark, a very talented and experienced uh, environmental law attorney. Um, and partner at Shoot Mahali and Weinberger, who works closely with our tribe. Sarah? Thank you so much. I appreciate the opportunity to be with you all. Um, and I uh, really appreciate the words that we've heard from our, our tribal leaders um, leading into this. I'm going to unfortunately switch gears from the inspirational words um, that we heard from chairman and from others and talk about the law, which I know is not as um, inspiring, but also very important to understand where we are in this process and what your voices um, and your thoughts and hard work can do in this process. So I'm going to share my screen. Okay. Hopefully you all can see that. You know, give me a thumbs up. Okay, great. Um, so I'm going to talk uh, for about 15 or so minutes on preparing comments on the Sergeant Quarry Sergeant Ranch Quarry EIR, um, and what that means under the California Environmental Quality Act. So first, I just want to start with what is the California Environmental Quality Act and what is an EIR? So CEQA, which is the acronym that we use for the California Environmental Quality Act, is state law, and it is mirrored off of the National Environmental Policy Act as a sort of stop, look, and listen statute. What it directs um, our local agencies to do before they make discretionary decisions is to evaluate the potential environmental and cultural impacts of their decisions uh, before they make them. And so the idea is that if we can first learn about what impacts we might have, we might make better decisions. But CEQA goes further than NEPA in that it's not just about um, providing information. There's actually substantive requirements as well. And the, the main ones are that if um, through that review process, we identify significant and significant impacts, then the agency has a duty to actually attempt to mitigate or avoid those impacts. Um, those are through mitigation measures and the study of alternatives. This comes up um, in significant projects through a document called an EIR or Environmental Impact Report. And that's what we are going to be talking about today is this EIR for the project. And I put up this quote, um, which comes from an early California Supreme Court case um, called Laurel Heights uh, that really talks about what the goal of the EIR and the CEQA comment period and um, review period really is. Um, and I think it's important to keep in mind and to know um, as we're thinking about preparing comments what role both the state legislature and the California courts um, had in mind for EIRs. Um, and, I, and I think that it's important to note that it's really a dual function. So we, we want to develop documents that both guide decision-making, but also inform the public. And so the true um, test of whether an EIR is valid and doing the work that is intended is both that it can help guide that decision-making process and, and lead towards better outcomes, but also that the public is informed of the process. And I think there's an interesting line at the bottom. The public will know the basis on which it's responsible officials either approve or reject environmentally significant action. And the public being duly informed can respond accordingly to action with which it disagrees. And so what this is alluding to is the fact that the public has an important role both in the comment making period um, and the uh, adequacy of the EIR period, but also has this role at the end of the process whereby it can hold agencies accountable for when they fail to um, conduct this process in an appropriate manner. And we'll talk a little bit about how the comment period plays into that. 
So first, I just want to go through what that process is, as I imagine many of you are not as intimately familiar with um, the CEQA process and how it inter interacts with the rest of the county's approvals. Um, so first, what happens is the applicant submits an application for a project, a discretionary project. Here, that happened quite some time ago. As the chairman alluded to, we've been waiting and waiting um, for this EIR to come out. The county undertakes the preparation of the EIR that is usually done through consultants, um, paid for and um, worked closely with, with the applicant. So it's an interesting process, one that is blessed by the legislature to involve the applicant, but it is ultimately the county's responsibility. Um, and then we get to this public comment on the draft EIR. And that's where we are right now. We are in the middle of the, um, the comment period. I think the ticker on the Protect Your Stock website says we're at 53 days out. Um, and, and that's what we're, we're talking about today. But I also wanted to talk about what happens after the comment period so you know how this fits into the broader um, context. So after comments are received, the county has a duty, and it's the county planning staff um, has a duty to review and respond to all of those comments. Um, and they do that in, typically it's in the final EIR. So we have a draft now, and once they respond to comments, it will be the final EIR. Some of those comments will say things like, thank you so much for your, um, your opinion. We will forward that on to decision makers. Others will involve um, substantive responses if you identify issues with the EIR. And on occasion, comments will result in changes to the EIR. If the changes are so significant, sometimes the EIR will be re-released as a recirculated draft EIR, and then you go through the comment period again. Um, and only after uh, you have that sort of final comment period where no new significant issues are raised, you get to the final EIR stage. Um, this process can take some time, particularly if, as we hope, the county gets lots of comments. It may be months before we see a final EIR or a decision on what is released after that, that period. Um, eventually, the county decision makers will, will consider that final EIR in conjunction with the rest of their discretionary action. Here, um, it will go first to the Planning Commission, and the Planning Commission will consider a use permit for the mine and the reclamation plan as well as some ancillary other findings they have to make. They will consider whether to certify the EIR is complete and compliant with state law. And then finally, they will um, make a determination as to whether they can make a statement of overriding considerations. Uh, this is a requirement in CEQA. This is part of the substantive requirement of CEQA. But if they find that there are significant and unavoidable impacts, as the draft EIR identifies across many areas, they can only approve the project if they have basically what they view as good reason to do so. So um, these can be things related to jobs or the economy or uh, other needs of the county, but they have to actually go through a public process with supported findings to say why, um, despite the fact that a project has significant and unavoidable impacts, it should nevertheless be approved. Um, so that will certainly be a part of this, um, uh, of this, the, the county's decision-making process for this project. Finally, after um, the Planning Commission makes this decision, whether it approves the project or denies the project, that can be appealed up to the Board of Supervisors. I fully expect that to happen here, um, and the Board of Supervisors will be the final decision-making body. The reason why I bring this all up is that it is very important to comment on a draft EIR because uh, this is the time when the county can respond, and it is when, uh, particularly if you're identifying legal inadequacies, um, your best voice to get that information into the document. However, because this also will go back to the Planning Commission and to the board, there will be other opportunities, and in fact, other um, times when the community and the tribal band really will be counting on your support. So I hope we see strong comment letters from you all today, but know that this process is not over. And we, I imagine the Protect Your Stock group will be calling on you again to provide comments at those later times. Okay, so uh, this gets to the types of comments that you might provide. Um, so I, we have a, a huge number of people here, probably with all sorts of mixes of backgrounds. Um, some of you may be um, experts or uh, students in areas, say, related to biology or hydrology or other technical areas. Um, that is great. We also might have people who are 
most enthusiastic supporters. And you may be wondering, this all seems very technical. This document is over 600 pages long. I'm not a lawyer, I don't know what to do. And I want to assure you that your voice is very important and very welcome in this context. And the reason for that is there are two types of comments and those can be um, combined. Uh, the first is really comments intended to persuade decision makers. These can be personal narratives, they can be persuasive. Um, if you're a county voter, you wanna identify yourself as one of the constituents um, of the decision makers. And it can be as simple as writing a letter that essentially explains why you came to this meeting today, why you believe in the cause, why you believe that the mine should be um, uh, disapproved, and, and why you believe it's important to honor the Amendments and Tribal Band and what they're asking for here. Does not need to be technical. And I think in fact that it is best if it comes from the heart. So if you're feeling inspired tonight, write it down, explain why you're feeling inspired to take action. And that can be a really good basis for your comments um, on the document. Um, however, if you're looking for something more and you do have some of that expertise or you have time and energy to read a long document, the other reason why we um, uh, draft comments is to identify legal deficiencies. And I'm gonna spend the rest of the time talking about how you can do that, even if this is the first time you ever have looked at this kind of document. The reason why this is important is because it, um, if you're going to later challenge a project in court, you need to do something called exhaust your administrative remedies. What that means is that you have to tell the county before you sue them, the reasons why what they're doing is illegal. And so in the CEQA context, what that means is you have to explain why the EIR is inadequate before we actually um, end up, uh, hopefully this never comes to litigation on our side, um, but if it does, you need to have explained to the county in advance uh, what the problem was. And so comments are the best way to do that. Um, our firm is working on preparing uh, legal comments, but we certainly welcome and um, are encouraged by the number of folks that are also interested in writing these kinds of, um, these types of comment letters. Um, so uh, one other thing I should say is that um, even if it is just the tribal ban that sues, you can rely on comments prepared by anyone. So it doesn't have to be that the tribe identifies the particular legal inadequacies and they can only then sue if the tribe said it. Essentially, if anyone says it at any point in the administrative record, you can use those arguments. So even if you're just writing on behalf of yourself, um, those comments are very, very helpful and welcome. And know that, um, again, if this comes to litigation, we will be reviewing all of them to see what you have said. Um, so I wanted to talk briefly, if you are going to prepare these kind of more substantive um, uh, comments about the, the adequacy of the EIR, I wanted to talk a little bit about what the EIR looks like and where you might start to look um, in these documents. They're very long and um, there's a bit of an art to reading them in a way that is efficient. So the first place I would start is with that summary right up top. And really what you should probably just read through are the first five issues. Um, this uh, will help explain what the document is, what the project is, and give you a very high level overview of what you can expect to see in the EIR. The end of the summary chapter is, a, is an exhaustive table of all the impact areas and mitigation measures in very small font. Know that those are um, replicated from other parts of the EIR. So um, for instance, if you're interested in biological resources, that's a summary of the biological resource impacts and mitigation measures. But you can also just read those in the biological resource chapter at the end, which I find easier to do. So I don't think you need to pay too much attention to F6. Um, the other item that I would encourage you to start with is chapter two, the project description. Um, so this is the chapter that talks about what the mine actually is and what the components are. Um, some of it is quite technical, but it also gives you the best sense of how um, they propose to actually construct the mine, where the different pits are, the um, transportation and conveyor system within it, how they plan to get the materials off site, the processing facility looks like. Um, so these are all sort of the details about um, the actual goings on of a mine operation. And knowing those is gonna be important for um, being able to articulate what the impacts might be. Then uh, we get into the um, chapter three, which goes item by item through the types of um, impact areas that the county has identified. 
Um, these are generally sort of set CEQA topics. Um, so in any EIR you pick up is almost always going to have similar categories. And if you are, you know, say, for instance, you have some background in public health or air quality, you might just focus on chapter 3.3, which is where air quality is found. Um, so that that's your, your quick uh, way of getting into the actual heart or meat of the document that you want to look at. The final chapter that I want to highlight is chapter four, which is the alternatives analysis. Um, so as I mentioned before, CEQA requires decision makers to study and look for alternatives that reduce impacts or that eliminate impacts. Um, the alternatives analysis is the place where they do that. In the alternatives analysis, what you will see is there, is, um, there are two different alternatives that look at sort of smaller versions of this project. One that um, eliminates the uh, two pits and another that sort of lowers the height of the mine to address aesthetic impacts. There's some indication that the um, project applicant may be actually looking at getting one of those reduced projects approved. So uh, it's basically what they said in one of the recent media pieces. So I would consider also paying attention to these sections and how they talk about these reduced footprint alternatives. I would not be terribly surprised if they end up trying to bring one of those forward as sort of a good faith effort at reducing impacts, um, even though the most significant impacts of the project are still going to remain even with these smaller footprints. Um, and then finally, uh, this is sort of the heart of the matter about what, what kind of comments we're looking for and what kind of comments you might put together. Um, really what this all comes down to, all of these questions that I've asked is, is the EIR functioning as an informational document? So if you as a lay person pick it up and read it, is it actually telling you what the impacts of these projects of the project are going to be in a way that is well reasoned and supported by evidence? And so um, while you're reading these various sections, um, some of the questions that you can ask are, first, are there inconsistencies in what they're saying? Do they say one thing in one place and a different thing in another place? It's important to point those out. Second, if they're making assumptions about something, so for instance, a lot of discussion about how much usable sand is going to be produced by this project. Are those explained and supported? I haven't seen that yet. Um, and then for impacts that are identified as less than significant or less than significant with mitigation, you want to see are those conclusions actually supported by evidence? And will those mitigation measures that they've identified actually work? A lot of times it's very difficult to tell if mitigation measures will work, particularly if they're um, sort of deferred to a later time. Um, and then for impacts that are identified as significant and unavoidable, are these impacts fully described or are they sort of cursory? And are the mitigation measures or are there mitigation measures that might be available that aren't included in here? It'd be very um, helpful to identify alternate mitigation measures that the county could have them adopt. Um, Next is, has the county fully failed to consider an impact? I think we heard Chair Lopez talk about some that we might consider um, making comments about, um, but there may be others, um, particularly if you know of something, you know, it's sort of, for instance, there's a, there's a chapter on hydrology. If, if you notice like, oh, well, they didn't consider this impact to this particular aspect of hydrology, that's important to point out. Um, the next one is, has the county considered all relevant evidence? So they're required to go out and look for all relevant evidence um, about the impacts of the project. And often they haven't consulted all plans or studies or other reports that may be out there. An important thing to note here is if you find something that you want to bring up, I strongly recommend that you actually send the county a copy of that report or plan or study. Um, links, there's some legal uh, they, or ambiguity about whether submitting just a link to something will work. And my caution is if this ends up in litigation four years down the line or something like that, that link might not work anymore. And so even if it, even if the county would consider it as evidence, it might not be there um, at that location and hard to find. So I always recommend submitting your documents um, as PDFs. Um, another question is, is the county's data incomplete, outdated, or not site specific? This happens all the time in bio, um, where they did surveys from, you know, 2012 or something like that, and things, times have changed. 
Um, next, are there likely to be indirect or cumulative impacts that have not been considered? So um, indirect or carry on effects from the project. Cumulative impacts are impacts that are from other adjacent projects um, that they need to study in conjunction with the impacts of this project. So if you know something nearby that's not mentioned, that's important to mention. And then finally, um, has the county correctly compared the alternatives? So have they looked at these alternatives and said, yes, this one is less, or yes, this one has more impacts, um, or is there another alternative that might be better? And then the final comment I wanna make is that there is no need for you to self-censor censor on this. So if you think you have something, you, you're confused by something, if you have questions or um, are, are um, concerned that they haven't connected the dots on their uh, conclusions, just raise it. There's really no downside. In fact, there's actually an upside. The longer that, uh, the more comments we submit, the more the county has to do work, the more expensive it is for the applicant, and the longer we run out the clock. And I think that's, those are all good things to do. So don't feel like you can only submit comments if you have them perfect, or if you have a really good understanding of the topic, just write them down. Um, and with that, I'm going to, this is my uh, contact information. Um, feel free to reach out with questions. Um, I'm, I'm happy to answer them. We also will have time for Q&A, um, but uh, I am available. So um, with that, I'm gonna turn this off and hand it back over to Hannah. Awesome. Thank you so much, Sarah, for walking us through that process and giving us some great information. Our next and final speaker uh, this evening will be Tiffany Yap. Um, she is a conservation biologist at the Center for Biological Di um, Diversity, who is also so uh, dedicated to supporting the protection of your stock, um, that she's actually joining us right now uh, from Norway, and it's about three o'clock in the morning. So thank you so much, Tiffany. I'll hand it over to you. Thanks, Hannah, and, and thanks everyone for being here. Happy to be here. Um, and thank you to all the great speakers um, providing a lot of information um, about this. So I, sorry, I'm going to share my screen. And hopefully that is, you all see the county website is that, yeah. Great. Um, so yeah, thanks everyone for being here. Um, I know that um, environmental impact reports can be kind of unwieldy and often intimidating documents, um, especially if you don't review them regularly um, or haven't really reviewed one at all before. Um, so I thought, um, or we all thought it might be helpful to just walk through one of the chapters that um, Sarah mentioned. So we're gonna walk through um, the biological resources. Um, Full disclosure slash disclaimer, um, I am a scientist and not an attorney. Um, so Sarah, please do correct me if I say anything inaccurate regarding any legal things. Um, okay, so I thought I would just start with where to find the EIR. Um, so if you go to the planning website, they have a, a website for the project. Um, and if you scroll down, you'll see that there's a um, uh, draft environmental impact report and a whole bunch of other documents that come with it. I've actually already um, opened all these just because I was a little bit worried about internet. So I'm not gonna click on them, but that's where you can find it. And so this is the draft environmental impact report. Um, and you can see what's actually kind of nice is that it's pretty well organized and has these tabs on the side to make it a little bit easier to navigate because these documents are just so, so big. Um, and uh, we're going to find the biological resources in the environmental settings, impacts, and mitigation measures. So you just click this um, arrow, and it'll open up all the different things. So there's there's the air quality, here's biological resources, and there's all sorts of all the other um, um, things that they need to consider. So here's the biological, and then even you can click on the arrow there and it'll kind of show you all the different things that are going, but we're gonna scroll through it. Um, okay, so in the, with, the, um, with each section, um, they often start with what the regulatory setting is. And so um, here they're supposed to describe all the federal, state and local policies and regulations that apply to the project or the project area. Um, and so, you know, here, 
you'll see they go like, you know, the Federal Endangered Species Act applies, um, the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. There, these are all the federal ones. And then if you keep going, here's the state regulations like the California Endangered Species Act and Fish and Game Code um, that applies for nesting birds and bats. So there's a lot of different things that um, they need to kind of um, consider so that they um, assess and make sure that they're in compliance with, with these regulations and policies. Um, and here are some of the local um, things, which includes the general plan, um, and then also some other ordinances and things like that. Um, and so what the, I mean, one thing that as you go through this, um, if you if you want to go through this, this portion of the section, um, some things to consider are, um, you know, is, uh, did they miss any regulations or policies that might apply to the project? Um, so. I'm sure there are other things too, but that's kind of one thing that I think about as I'm going through um, the, that section. And then the next thing that comes up is the environmental setting. And so this is where they're supposed to describe the existing conditions of biological resources. Um, and they can use a variety of, of resources for that. Um, so that's things like existing databases, like the California Natural Diversity Database, which is maintained by um, the California Department of Fish and Wildlife or CDFW. Um, they can look at scientific literature, um, and sometimes they can use other publicly available data, although uh, what I have found is oftentimes they don't. So, but things like iNaturalist or eBird, and sometimes even Instagram and Twitter, it's actually pretty amazing. I've seen, I've, um, I remember going to a talk where someone found a really rare species in an area that it hadn't been seen in many, many years. Um, and the way they were able to, and so the, that person um, didn't know it, but they took a picture of it and put it on their Instagram story. And so then a biologist at the US Geological Survey um, saw it and was like, wait a minute, we haven't seen this in so many years, like this is amazing. And it was a really good documentation and really important information to know like where the species are, are still roaming. Um, so that's another thing. Those are other resources. And then oftentimes um, the consultants will go do site visits and um, field surveys. And they, those can be general or targeted surveys, just kind of depending on, on what they choose to do. Um, yes. And so in this section, um, they will be talking a lot about the different habitat and wildlife that um, that may or, that may that are known to occur, are likely to occur, or may or historically occurred in the project area. Um, and so when they're identifying different habitats, um, that can be things like um, where are the grasslands in the area, riparian areas, the oak woodlands, um, things like that. And then um, it also includes, um, sorry, um, these documents are very long. And so I think I didn't um, consider how long it would take to scroll through. Um, but so it, you can see through here, all the different um, habitats that they're going through. They, they describe the vegetation that's there and also the wildlife that might occur there. Um, and then there are also regulated and sensitive habitats. So that's things like um, waters of the US, which are um, under the jurisdiction of the Army Corps. Um, and then there's also waters of the state, which are um, Central Coast Regional Water Quality Control Board and CDFW um, regulate. And that can be things like also drainages and wetlands that meet certain criteria um, based on court cases and other rules. So um, I'm sorry if this is like a bombardment of a lot of different information as I'm scrolling through this giant document, but I'm, I'm hopeful this is helpful. Okay, so then the next section, they talk about special status species, and that could be um, plants or animals. And um, oftentimes, and even and in this document, special status species uh, are defined as species that are listed, proposed, or candidate species under the Federal Endangered Species Act, um, listed or candidate species under the State Endangered Species Act, um, uh, California native plant, Society, California Rare Plant Rankings, um, CDFW Species of Special Concern, um, CDFW Fully Protected Species, 
Um, and I think that's it. And this is, um, so this is where you can look into more detail if there are species that you're interested in. Um, so like maybe California condor or California tiger salamander, mountain lions, um, they should be described in these sections um, and how they relate to the area. So, so this is a table of uh, the potential plant species, special status plant species in the area. Um, and here the wildlife. I wonder if there's a better way to go through this. I'll just keep scrolling. Um, okay. And you'll see the you see this there is steelhead here. Um, so, and this is um, sorry this doesn't all fit on the screen, but um, this is a map that shows I mentioned the California Native Diversity Database, and so this map shows. Um, some of the species that are on that air, um, in that database that are in this area. And so here's the gray area is the project site and all the different colors kind of indicate um, different species that have been documented in there. So you can see, and this is a three mile radius of um, from the project site. And it goes through all these different species. And then um, it, the, the next, and then the next section is they talk about wildlife corridors and habitat connectivity. And so this is where they should be describing local, regional, and continental connectivity and the potential uh, movement pathways for wildlife, both natural connectivity areas as well as potential infrastructure that animals might use to cross nearby roads. So like culverts or undercrossings along the 101 freeway. Um, and at, I mean, we can get into a little bit, but like um, the, the area where um, Eurostock is, is a really important connectivity area for um, species in the Santa Cruz Mountains, um, the Gabalon Range to the south, and the Diablo Range to the, to the east. So this whole section <laughs> of um, the environmental setting um, this is where it's really important to look and see how they're describing the area and what occurs or is likely to occur or historically occurred in the area. And because this information is used to assess the project's impacts to resources, it's incredibly important for the existing conditions to be described as accurately as possible. Um, and so often, so that's kind of what, what we're looking for, as Sarah mentioned, or one of the many things we're looking for. And um, Oftentimes the main text of the EIR doesn't is is even though it's long, it's it can still be somewhat general. And so um, a lot of the underlying information or a lot of the methods they used or the things that they considered um, are discussed more in depth in appendices and other technical reports. Um, and so if you're interested in looking at this and seeing how well they assess the environmental setting then something that you might want to consider is also looking at the appendices that are provided or any technical reports that are, reports that are provided. And so that again is at the website. Here was the draft EIR and some of the appendices, I mean, for now what will um, would be useful are is Appendix E, the biological resources. Um, and then, you know, I would consider hydrology and water quality. Appendix I is also probably very important. Um, and if you look at technical reports, the biotic evaluation is really important because again, that's where they're gonna be telling us where um, uh, the, the methods they use to make the conclusions that they made um, and the assumptions that they had while they were doing it. So here's the um, biological resources appendix, and you can see it is quite long, um, but it, should provide some of the technical information that, that they used to come to the conclusions that they did. And here's the biotic evaluation. Um, and so as you look through these, the um, again, just to reiterate some of the things that Sarah mentioned, um, as you look through this and review it, they're just, these same questions are gonna keep coming up. So um, when they're doing their assessment of the environmental setting and um, providing, the habitats and the species that may occur there, like 
Are they accurately portraying the existing condition conditions? Are there assumptions or conclusions based on the best available science? How did they determine if a species is present or likely present? What methodologies did they use in their field surveys and assessments? Are they following the US Fish and Wildlife Service or C and or CDFW protocols or guidelines? Um, are there any studies or technical reports that they omitted that should be considered? Um, yeah, so those are just some questions as you go through these um, to, to be constantly asking. Okay. And so then um, that's just, you know, setting the stage of what are the existing conditions that they then have to assess how the project will impact. So the next section um, discusses the impacts. So it's the impact evaluation and they provide the significance criteria here, which are based on the CEQA guidelines um, to determine if the project will have a substantial adverse impact on any biological resources described um, that are that may occur on the site. Um, all right. So let's see. As they go through this, um, basically the way that they wrote this out, and this is very common, is that they'll explain what the significance criteria are, and then they'll go kind of through um, each individual thing that they described and whether or not the product will impact it. Um, and, and it's based on, so this, so this first one is project activities would result in adverse effects on special status plant species, right? And they're gonna be looking at the construction of the project as well as the operation of the project and then the reclamation that they claim they're going to be doing. Um, and then they provide this summary of what they think, the, if whether or not the impact will be significant, significant and unavoidable or less than significant um, with mitigation. Sometimes there's no impact. So it just, it really varies. Um, and again, like as Sarah mentioned, if the impacts are significant, then they need to provide mitiga mitigation measures to reduce or minimize those impacts. Um, and, and so when we're reviewing the impact analysis and proposed mitigation, um, it's important to, again, have those question, these questions in mind, like, is the impact assessment accurate? Um, is it based on the best available science? Are there any studies or technical reports they omitted? What is the evidence that they're using to base their conclusions on? Um, and then you really wanna look and see if the mitigation is adequate. Um, and similarly, is it based on the best available science? So um, one thing that I that comes up a lot when looking at mitigation measures is um, sometimes there'll be a reference to plans in the future for mitigation or like developing a plan at some point to make the mitigation happen, um, like a habitat mitigation and monitoring plan or a planting and maintenance plan. And so again, the, when you see those, I think it's really important, are those plans appropriate? Do they provide enough detail so the public and decision makers can understand it and determine whether or not they're adequate to and enforceable? So enforceability is also a really important thing here um, when looking through the different mitigation measures because you wanna make sure that um, not only are they providing like these options that like, oh, these kinds of things could mitigate, but it's really important to make sure that those measures are implemented um, and enforced over the long term so that we can see that, that these mitigation measures are in fact um, reducing and minimizing the impacts that they claim they are. So there's quite a bit of um, the impact analysis and the, um, um, mitigation measures that are provided. Um, and then after that is um, the cumulative analysis. Um, so looking at cumulative uh, impacts based on other projects that are in the vicinity or nearby that could also, that they kind of contribute as a whole more, more impacts. And so it describes the project um, in that way. And again, 
it's important when you're looking at that to consider, you know, did they omit any projects that are being implemented or proposed? Um, and then are their conclusions accurate and based on the best available science? And are they adequately mitigating those impacts? So I think that's it for the EIR. I realize again that it's this is kind of a lot and really technical or not really technical, but it's a lot and it's technical. Um, and I know we've been talking to you quite a bit. Um, so I wanted to just briefly kind of um, kind of let's see the the Zoom thing is blocking my ability to click on the tabs that I have opened. So hopefully this works. Okay. So just to, I just kind of wanted to go over some resources that you could look to as you're going through the review to see like whether or not they're using the best available science. Um, and again, I mentioned there are a lot of different resources out there. So one thing that um, I find really helpful is CDFW has this project called Areas of Conservation Emphasis. So they've identified these areas and they've kind of um, categorized them so that you can like reference that. Um, and so they have this tool um, what, that allows us to look at different things. So you could look at um, species diversity and you could also look at terrestrial connectivity. And so that's kind of what I wanted to focus on today just because um, this area is just so incredibly important for wildlife connectivity. Um, and so just to, I, I realize this is kind of a weird, weird scale and it's hard to um, see the, the landmarks, but this is, this is right where the project is. Um, and the colors here indicate the dark gray um, are irreplaceable and essential corridors. And then this blue is conservation planning linkages and so the blue and the gray are really kind of like the highest tiers in terms of what's important for wildlife connectivity. And then the green is the third highest. And so as you can see with um, Eurostock being right here, it's really important for wildlife connectivity um, towards the Santa Cruz Mountains to the north, the Gabalon Range to the south, and again, the Diablo Range to the east. And um, really this is one, the only area that is able to have wildlife move through all three of those ranges. And it's one of the last remaining ones. So it's just really, really important. And just to emphasize that again, this is a report that was done separately from CDFW. And um, this talks about the Santa Cruz Mountains and the Gab Gabalon Range linkage design. And again, let's see. The project is around here. And so you can see this yellow, the yellow and the green and the light green, those are all areas that show that are really important for wildlife connectivity. And I wanted to show this because it just gives a little bit of a bigger picture of the, the regional importance for this connectivity. There is so much um, uh, fragmentation in this area already. And this is just such a, um, a really, really sensitive and critical area for connectivity. Okay. And then there are other, I mentioned that there were like some community science um, databases that folks could look at. And so things like eBird can be really helpful. Um, so if you're interested in looking at California condor and how they occur through in the area of Eurostock, um, you can just go to the eBird website um, and they provide these occurrence data where people have observed them. Um, and so you can see here again, here's a map and you can, the, um, the project is around here somewhere. And you can see that there's been condor sightings around this area, which means that it, it could be likely that condors may fly through here, may forage here. Um, and so that's um, really important to consider and, and mention. And, um, and then again, Lee spells Vireo is also a special status species. Um, and if you look at the map here, you can see that they've here again is um, where the product is. And so they are very likely to occur in the area. And so they should be um, treated as such and um, impacts to them should be avoided and mitigated as much as possible. 
Um, and then there are another way that you um, you can add information. Sarah mentioned, you know, that sometimes if you're citing information that links are um, not always uh, to be trusted. Um, the, it's really great when, fo when folks are able to include the records themselves. And so if you're citing scientific articles about certain things, um, it's, if you include that in the submission of your letter, then that's really helpful. And so here's a paper that was, um, published in, um, 2018, and this talks about the Mount Lion genetic health, um, throughout the state. And so this area, it's really important for wildlife connectivity. It's also really important for mountain lions because um, the, the local mountain lions are um, struggling. They have poor genetic health due to um, habitat fragmentation. Um, and so we really need to, um, to protect them. We need to uh, maintain existing connectivity and enhance connectivity where we can um, so that they can roam more freely, find their food that they need, get find unrelated mates and also be able to adapt to climate change. And so I just kind of wanted to give a little bit of a variety of the different resources that you can use to you know, read up on things um, or if you already know about them to submit them. Um, but there are a lot of different ways that, um, that people can contribute. And I think it's really great um, that you're all here and, and helping us fight the fight. And I think I'll stop there. Thank you so much for listening. Awesome. Thank you so much, Tiffany, for walking us through the report and um, giving those resources as well. Um, we're going to go ahead and move towards the Q&A right now. So we're going to go ahead and open up the floor to all of our panelists uh, for Q&A. If you have a question that hasn't or that you haven't asked already, please make sure you put it either in the Q&A function of Zoom or put it into the chat, please. Um, also, just a reminder that after the Q&A, we will be inviting you all to join us in our workshop um, where we will have breakout rooms with experts in there um, that you can dive in deeper into different topics you might be interested in, as well as um, working on drafting your own um, personal comment to the letter or your comment letter. So I have a few questions. We can make sure every um, panelist is back on screen or back, and then we will get started with our questions. Um, I do want to just um, go ahead and mention that we will be providing a video accompanied with list of resources and links that were referenced in the presentations, um, and that will be posted on a uh, Protect Your Stock website um, this weekend, just to let everyone know, because I do know um, that was a lot of the chat um, that I was listening or looking at as well. So don't worry, it will be available for all of you to go back and reference as well. So our first question um, is going to be to you, Chairman. Um, how long has it been since Emma Mutsin have been allowed to be on your stock land? As a tribe, our people have not been on those lands since the 1860s. That way, you know, 1862 comes to mind. That's when a smallpox epidemic came through and wiped out, you know, 90% of our members, and then the other 10 were just removed. So approximately that long, that'd be 160 years. Awesome. Thank you so much for answering that. Um, we have a next, our next question. Um, maybe Val or Sarah or um, whoever wants to maybe go uh, take address this question. Um, the question is, I understand that that environmental impacts can consider can consider impact on any species of animals or plants, um, is there anything in the process that we can consider impacts on racial or ethnic groups of human beings? So is there a process that we can consider impacts on racial or ethnic groups 
of human beings. So do you want me to jump in on this, Chairman? Yes, please. <laughs> So unfortunately, I would just get angry. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I am too, but I will temper it. Um, unfortunately, the California Environmental Quality Act does not recognize impacts on to specifically to the social or economic, those are the words they use, status of people. And so that is, I, I think, a little bit vague. Um, and certainly many tribal advocates have articulated why CEQA should include these issues. I think it is wholly appropriate to advocate that these the issues that Chairman spoke of should be included in an EIR, but I also understand, or I, I should say, I have observed that most EIRs do not cover these topics. Um, and, and a court, I, you know, I'm not sure what they would do with that kind of question. Um, however, that is, absolutely a reason that the Board of Supervisors should consider um, in making its decision. And so um, even if it's not strictly a CEQA issue, it is still within the purview of the county to consider it when, when they make a decision on these discretionary um, uh, applications. So um, if you feel compelled to write about uh, some of those topics, absolutely write about them. Awesome, thank you. Um, and following up, um, following up that question, we have another question. Um, but CEQA, I think I'm pronouncing that right, uh, does not require considerations of cultural and tribal cultural resources, adverse impacts on known historical or archaeological resources, a uh, damage to unrecorded. Uh, subsurface prehistoric or historic archaeological resources, disturbance of human rights, right? Yeah, so CEQA is very um, traditionally associated with impacts to places, um, impacts to the environment. And so what the EIR does talk about is impacts to places of um, historical and cultural significance. If you look in the, um, that particular chapter that's being referenced on cultural and tribal cultural resources, that's what you'll see is about the impacts to the places of importance to the tribes. Um, it does not, however, talk about the impacts to tribes and tribal people separately um, from the environment. It has to be connected to an environmental purpose. All right. Um, the next question we have is, um, oh, sorry. Thank you. Oh, okay. The next question we have is, um, can non-residents of California or Santa Clara County member or Santa, Santa Clara County submit comments? That's one question. There's three questions. Sorry. Um, the next one was, uh, will Sergeant Farm um, LLC and the people who support them also be able to submit public comments. And the third question to that um, section is, will the comments be able um, for the public to read? Um, I'm happy to take all of those. So uh, in reverse order, um, will they be available to the public? Yes. Um, so anything, um, provided during this comment period will be included in a fine in the final EIR. The actual copies of the letters will be. Um, comments provided to the county later, it depends. Um, the county sometimes posts them, sometimes doesn't. They're part of the public record, but whether they're readily available is another question. But in this period, yes, those will be available. Um, Yes, uh, the Sergeant Ranch folks and their supporters can certainly make comments during this period. I typically find though that they stay pretty quiet during this period, which is really focused on whether their document is adequate. They believe it's adequate, right? They want it to be adequate. <laughs> and so they're not gonna come in and say anything otherwise. You'll get them though showing up at um, the Planning Commission and the Board of Supervisors uh, for sure. Um, and then what was the last question? Sorry, Hannah, or the first one you asked? Um, can non-residents? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Non-residents is non-residents. Absolutely. I just mentioned it because if you are a resident of Santa Clara County and you're writing sort of this personal letter, it can be really helpful to connect with your, the supervisor that represents you. Awesome. Thank you for answering those. 
Um, we have another question. Um, maybe Tiffany could address this. Um, is not using best science or best available science a valid reason to comment negatively? Um, so, sorry, can you reread that question? <laughs> yeah, no problem. So, is not using in quotation marks best science or best available science a reason to comment negative? negatively in a native way. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, Sarah, maybe you can chime in after me, but I think, um, yeah, that, that is very much so what you can do and what I encourage you to do. Um, mm -hmm. If you see something that you think or that you think or know is inaccurate and you have substantive evidence that you can submit to back that up, you definitely submit it and say, you know, um, and it could be negative or positive, but like it, oftentimes it's negative if it's not following the best available science, right? So, so you definitely, yes. <laughs> awesome, thank you. All right, another question we have, um, maybe Sarah, you could address this one. Um, if someone is interested in more of a technical comment as well as a personal one, should those two be combined or separated? Uh, question one. A uh, second question is, is it okay or good to write more than one letter to keep each subject distinct? Or is it better to co-author a public comment or to have two people submit separate comments? Yeah, um, so <laughs> generally speaking, I would submit one comment during this comment period. And so if you're wanting to write with someone else, if you're wanting to combine technical and personal, um, I would just put it all into one. Of course, if you think of something else later, you can feel free to submit another one, but I, you can. there's no reason to separate them out in this comment period. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, there will be other times for comments. And in particular, once we get towards the planning commission and the board of supervisors, that's when you're really trying to make a personal compelling case to the board and um, to the planning commission to, to vote with us. And so um, to the extent you, you plan to submit later comments, those are probably gonna be more of a personal nature unless something new comes up. Awesome. And I think we might have time for just one more question. Um, can we list, oh, sorry, uh, one more question, and it's coming to me right now, <laughs> live. <laughs> so I'm going to wait a moment to see what this last question will be. All right, maybe Val and Alexi could address this question. So listen up, here we go. Um, it, the question is, okay, the question is, can you speak more to the way EIR addresses tribal cultural resources and what does that mean? This has always been a big issue for us with counties, tribal cultural resources. Just the definition of what is a tribal cultural resource. Um, you know, in the past, like say for example, you find a bedrock mortar, you know, and this is where they were, and you know that they were grinding acorn or pine nut or seeds or some such um, material there. You know, they say that rock, that bedrock mortar is your cultural resource. But our tribe argues well beyond that. What was used inside that bedrock mortar? Were they grinding acorns? Well, then the, the acorns are part of the cultural resource. Pine nuts, then the pine nuts. Seeds, then the seeds. You know, it could be that they were you, you know, using paint for ceremony. It could be that they were, um, um, grinding um, um, certain materials for um, certain ceremonies and stuff like that, you know? And, and so, you, have, you know, you want to identify what was used inside that bedrock mortar and recognize that as, the, as part of the, the cultural resource. 
And that re and, and now then that cultural resource could expand well beyond just where that bedrock mortar is. And that's where you get to the traditional cultural landscapes or properties. And that's what we have here is a traditional cultural property. And, um, and, and you know, and you know, and we we and then the other thing here, because this is a, a sacred site, they wanted us to identify really clearly. Well, where was the ceremony actually held? You know, here is where our fire was set, and, and this is where the people would gather. Well, then that's your cultural resource, and it's okay for us to destroy the rest of your stock. No, this is it's you know, as a sacred site. Uh, and as a whole, as a all of all of your stock is a very important sacred site as a whole. And and Sarah, can you you you've been working with us on this for a long time, and you can explain it better than I can. Or Alexi, perhaps you can explain it better. So Alexi or Sarah. I mean, I think you did a nice job. CEQA has a very specific definition of a tribal cultural resource. Um, which I can, I'll find the site too, and I can put in the, the chat. Um, but it is, you know, it's not, sounds good definition, <laughs> frankly. Um, it doesn't make the connection necessarily between the, um, the physical impacts and the cultural and spiritual impacts as we've been articulating. And so I, I think you spoke to it well, Chairman. So unfortunately, we are out of time, and I know I saw in the chat that my question didn't get answered, and I didn't want it answered. We'll stick around because we are going to end uh, this meeting in just a moment, um, and then moving over to a new meeting um, for our um, workshop time. So we hope you can stay um, and join us. If you didn't get your answer, your question answered, or you still have lingering questions, want to dive in deeper into something, um, please make sure you stick around. Um, and get that. Um, I did want to make an announcement as well, or a couple of announcements before we end um, that are related to taking further action. The clock is ticking and we, we need to jump into action. Um, so you can see on the slide that we have a few different ways that you can um, take further action during this comment period. Um, so it's really important right now that we have uh, our biggest collective impact um, that can make that we can um, have on the decision makers of Santa Clara County during this EIR comment period. Uh, the quality and the quantity of the comments of letters um, submitted is a key aspect of which is why um, in addition to you writing your own comment, we ask you to consider also recruiting others, individuals or organizations to submit letters as well. We are going to be holding a uh, rally for Eurostock coming up um, September 10th. So everyone mark your calendars now on your phone, take it out, mark the calendar, September 10th. Um, the time is going to be determined and more information will be coming out shortly, um, but it will be in San Jose downtown um, at the McEntee uh, Plaza on 70 West Heading, Santa Clara County area right there. Uh, we need to show them that our tribe does not stand alone and we cannot just be brushed aside anymore. We hope to have hundreds of people show up um, to stand with us. And the only way for that to happen is that if many of you help us spread the word and inspire other people to show up. We also wanted to make sure that you know um, about the Zoom-based public hearing that will be held um, by Santa Clara Planning Commission on August 25th uh, to receive spoken comments from the public regarding the EIR for the Sergeant Corey project. Um, so make sure you mark your calendars for this as well. Um, Thursday, August 25th, um, it will be on uh, Zoom. So you'll be able to go ahead and do that and um, 
This will be an opportunity to personally reach the planning commissioners who will be making the initial decision on whether or not to approve or deny the mining permit. Um, and each speaker will be permitted to make a short two or three minute statement depending on the time they give us. Um, Sarah, did you have a something to say before? Sorry. Yeah, I just had a brief uh, comment just so that we're getting a lot of questions about um, specific inadequacies that we've already identified. I just want to note that we are hard at work at reviewing the document as I noted, it's very long. And so we're still doing that work. Um, it's actually not super critical for people to submit the same comment or the same studies or the same things over and over again. Um, as long as one person says them, it, it counts from an exhaustion perspective. So I wouldn't worry too much about figuring out the specific inadequacies and then re repeating these over and over again. Um, focus instead on what you care about and on um, that personal connection. Um, however, that said, uh, check back on the Protect Your Stack website. We are working on some additional materials to go up there um, that may be helpful. So hopefully that didn't step, speak out of turn there, but just wanted to get the, that overarching question answered. Awesome. Thank you so much for answering that. Um, I do want to take this time to thank everyone for coming. I really appreciate we all appreciate you all being here. Um, if you have time and uh, want to move over to our interactive writing workshop time, you can um, ask additional questions. Uh, there will be breakout rooms as well. Um, I think if we put the Zoom link, we can put it in the chat and then there's a slide as well. So if you want to copy that um, and paste it into the chat. Um, and it'll be workshop time get anyone's ideas. I know I saw some people in the chat say I've already have some ideas then ready to write or maybe just even get some things down on paper or talk with others about it. Uh, but we want to thank our speakers and for all of you who've joined this evening. Uh, we hope we've given you some tools and inspiration to be able to write your own comment letter and to get more involved um, with speaking out to protect your stock. Uh, we we'll hope you join us um, for our rally coming up and um, during that public hearing time. If you need more information, always go to uh, protectyourstock.org as well. Um, if you all are ready to go ahead and move over to the next uh, meeting, uh, the link right here, protectyourstock.org slash um, workshop time. If you want to copy that and paste it into your browser, um, it should make sure you or you can click the link in the chat. Thank you again, everyone, for coming. We hope to see you um, later this month and uh, next month for our rally. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you. Hannah and everyone. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you all.